So the objectives for today's talk are to describe the differences between um, typing red cells using serology and molecular, um, to list two types of blood groups that, and the technical and clinical issues associated with typing them, and at the end we'll talk about the indications for molecular blood group typing. So what are blood groups? This is a schematic of uh, a, blood a red blood cell surface. Um, blood groups are a very heterogeneous group of molecules. Um, they range from being the M and S blood system is carried on glycophorin A and B. Um, the ABH or ABO blood group system is actually carbohydrates put onto glycoproteins. And then the majority of the rest of the blood group systems are um, glycoproteins that have multiple transmembrane domains. So we actually group those all together and call them blood groups. Um, because of their antigenicity and transfusion. So the evolution of blood group typing is um, that blood group typing is not for defining disease. It's to type um, red cells to the characteristics of a red cell. Um, the original and the first way we've ever figured out how to do this is using serology, and we do that by um, looking for the presence or absence of an antigen on the cell surface using antisera. Um, more recently, in the past couple of decades, we've started doing um, molecular blood group typing. We don't actually get the DNA from the red cells. We get DNA from a buffy coat or from amniocytes or other sources. And that is to, we actually look for the gene that codes for that antigen. And then we, we can render a predicted red cell phenotype based on the genotype. And that's based on our knowledge of the SNP that changes from one to make it one blood group or another blood group. Or sometimes we use sequencing technology. So just as a review for people to, to think about why do we even type red cells. Um, so it's, for, it's really for the purpose of transfusion or incompatibility. So here's just a little schematic. If you have a blood donor who is D positive and they donate a unit of blood, there'll be D on those red cells. And then if you transfuse that to a patient who is D negative, or here I said little d, um, over time that person could make anti-D antibody, and that's the little green immunoglobulins I put there. So then in the future, if this person comes back and you give them a unit, another unit of red cells that has D on those red cells, you can have a hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, and this is also sort of the similar idea of what happens in maternal fetal incompatibility and what can happen if the antibody can cross the placenta. So um, I'm going to start by talking um, a little bit technical about the technique of blood group typing. Um, so I'm going to start off with serology. So if these are red cells and the little green triangles are antigens on the red cell, to serologically type, we add an antisera, so anti-D, anti-Kel, and it will bind. But we can't see that. Blood banking, the serological blood banking is very, um, it, um, it's not primitive because we, <laughs> it, it does what we need it to do, but it's very low tech. Um, you can do it with just a centrifuge, pretty much, and some test tubes. And so you'll see that, but we can't see that reaction. So what we do is we add Coombs reagent, which is anti-IgG, and that makes, it basically bridges it and makes it bigger, bigger agglutinates, if you will. And then we can see it, and this bottom is just showing the, um, what you're looking for. So you're actually looking at, under a light, looking for agglutination, visual agglutination. Um, you can use IgM-based antisera, and that's big enough because it's usually in a pentamer form that you can, you can see that visually without adding the Coombs reagent. So that's how we type to say something is positive or negative on a cell. So if somebody's D negative or D positive, you can do it this way. So what are some of the problems with serological typing? Um, in the first test tube up on the left, multiple red cell populations. So this is someone who's been transfused. Um, usually quite a bit, they'd have to be transfused, you know, we would call it potentially a massive transfusion. But if you tried to use that test, take that test tube of blood and tried to figure out using antisera what if the person was positive for and negative for, for the blood groups, you couldn't tell. And we have what we call mixed field. Um, and that's when you look at agglutination, some of the cells would be fluid and some of the cells would be agglutinated. Um, and the bottom left is interfering antibodies, so we call that usually a warm autoantibody. So a patient has lots of immunoglobulin stuck on their cell. The antisera actually can't get in to, to, to attach to the antigen. Um, in the upper right is no sample available, so this is in the case of a fetus, trying to figure out if the fetus is positive or negative, so if the, if the mother potentially has an antibody, and we want to know, is the fetus at risk for hemolytic disease of the newborn, we, can type an, we, we can't type the fetus because we can't get a fetal blood sample unless we do an amniocentesis, um, or actually an intrauterine um, cord. 
Um, when there's no anti-sera available, and I'll keep, I'll, I'll say that a few times, there's a couple blood groups that we don't have anti-sera for that just don't exist. So we, we can't type them in, in the serology lab. And then another one that I'll talk a lot more about is underlying genetic differences in blood group um, expression. So um, basically this is that someone might type serologically one way and with different anti-sera, because anti-sera is just as strong as whatever, it's, whatever, it's, whatever epitope it's directed against. <clears throat> So molecular typing. So um, I've used this slide a lot, and interestingly, I've added the pluses and minuses as things have changed over time as we've gotten better and better at molecular typing. Um, uh, the pros are, you know, no blood sample is necessarily needed, although it's usually what we use. Um, you can avoid tedious procedures in the red cell serology lab. This one probably could do plus minus because sometimes they're quite tedious procedures in the molecular lab as well. Um, no antisera available. That's the Dombrock blood group that we that we don't have antisera for. And another pro is that we can learn genetic alterations that are significant or that are clinically significant potentially. The cons, and I put a plus minus recently, is that it's expensive. Um, recently, some of the um, anti-sera reagent uh, manufacturers have increased the cost of those reagents 100% in the past year. Um, so the cost of anti-sera is actually increasing wildly, whereas genomics is kind of coming down. So it's kind of, I would say it's plus minus now. Um, molecular blood group typing is relatively slow meaning that right now we don't have the ability, if somebody needs a transfusion now, to run a DNA sample and figure out the answer right now. Um, the phenotype doesn't always correlate with the genotype. What that means is that, again, your anti is directed against an epitope, and it might, if you look at the genotype, it might not make, where, if you, depending on where you look in that gene, you might think that they're positive or negative, but it might be a, a variant expression of that gene. So it's, it, we, and we don't always know, and that's why I said the science is evolving. So for techniques, I'm going to focus on the gene array technique, um, and then throughout the talk I'll talk about some of the more well-known techniques. Um, but the gene array is, um, is a chip that we have. Um, it's a commercial-based commercial chip, and I'll talk about that more in detail. We also have um, PCR SSP and real-time PCR, RFLP and genetic sequencing, and I'll talk about those more just in the applications and some cases I'm going to review. So um, the chip that we use at the blood center, um, is made by Bioarray Solutions. It's called an HEA bead chip. It's um, basically what happens is they take this is how it's, how it's produced. There's a there's a bead, and they use for the for the for the red cell chip. They use about 40 um, spectrally identifiable beads, and then they and that's what the encoded beads are. The functionalized beads then they add a, an oligonucleotide probe to them, and then they covalently bind them to an array. <clears throat> and then what happens for the reaction is that you take a sample of the patient's or donor's DNA and you do um, a, a, P, a, a multiplex PCR that generates about 18 amplicons that are about 100 to 300 base pairs, so short parts of the gene. And they're, they're actually targeted, the, P, the primers are targeted to get around the SNP sites. Most blood groups are, desi are one, either A or B, um, their designation is usually just by a, a small SNP, and that's what we're really looking for. Um, and so that is then added to the, added to the, ch the, the array, and then this, um, the, on the left, you'll see that there's a mismatch there. So if, there, if there's a match, it, it, it attaches and then it elongates using spectr you know, spectral, spe uh, fluorescently tagged DTPs, and on the, on the, on, that's on the right, and on the left, it doesn't elongate. And so, and you let it, in you let it incubate, and then you take a picture, basically. So this is how you take a picture. Um, the chip has two ways you could use. You can either have 96 wells or eight on a, on a slide. We use, an eight, we use the eight slide platform. And the, basically, it goes through the computer and it is decoded using, the, there's 4,000 chips, even though there's only 40 beads, there's 4,000 chips, there's multiple copies of the same reaction happening. And so what the computer does by taking the picture is it analyzes the position and the color of the bead and the fluorescence, comparing the CVs to each other, and the number of them that are, that are positive and negative. And using that, and, the, the, and this here just shows the blood group, which is on the left. So I showed those at the beginning on the picture. Duffy, Dombrock, um, LW, Colton, Sienna, Diego, Kid, Kel, Lutheran, MNS, and RH. And the reason I point those out to you is that D and ABO are not on this chip. 
Okay, so when we think about transfusion medicine, the first two things you think about when you're transfusing somebody is ABO and D. And so just note that those are not on this chip, okay? <clears throat> and I'll talk about why that is as we go. And the polymorphisms are on the right. So those are basically the SNPs that the, that the um, probes are, are trying to pick up. And this is pretty much what we get back. So then, so what happens is that the software that does this is, is actually beamed through the internet to the company that, that owns the chip. And then you can pull up the answer on their software. And it uses, this is basically absorbance on the bar graph. And then at the bottom, it basically makes calls based on the SNP being present or absent and tells you based on the SNP being present or absent, what is the interpreted phenotype? Okay, so we're looking at a SNP and we're saying if, it, if this SNP is positive, then it's this phenotype. So that's the chip. So I'm going to move on to a blood group now, and you'll, then I'll talk more about some of the other techniques. So I'm going to start with ABO, and I thought that this is kind of a fascinating um, map because ABO um, it can be used to actually look at human variation over, over the world. And if you look at the upper left, the B blood group, you can see is um, the, the intensity is the highest intensity is the blues and the dark, bl and the dark reds. Um, is it the most in Central Asia? Um, and A, over here on the right, th something notable is, you know, up in, the, up in Alaska and down through Canada, that's the Blackfoot Indian tribe, very high um, instance of having the A blood group system. And then um, down South America, Central America, almost no A, whereas O, which is at the bottom here, is almost all in Central and South America. So it's just, it's just interesting to think about that when we talk about blood banking, a lot of, you'll, you'll hear a blood banker say, well, what's their race? And we ask that because of, of this fact that, that they do, that blood groups vary with race. <clears throat> so more on the ABO blood group system. Um, and more specifically, it's really called the ABH blood group system. And that's because of um, the backbone for AB. Is, um, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a carbohydrate blood group system. So that it's different than most blood group systems. The inheritance, if you're A and B, they're co-dominant. And if you're O, it's recessive. It means you don't have a copy of A or B. So that's just the little Punnett square at the top, just showing that. And how um, AB, ABO works is that your DNA is not coding for a big protein that's stuck in your, in your red cell membrane. It's actually coding it for an enzyme. So your DNA will make, your, make RNA. And if you, have, if you have the gene for A, you actually make an A enzyme. And the A enzyme adds the A sugar to the H backbone. So it's different than a lot of our other blood group systems. And so, you know, one of the things we say is that, you know, A, A and B antigens, they're not primary gene products, and it's sort of important to understand their adopted blood groups. <clears throat> so the determinants of the ABO blood group, this is a picture of them. So the H antigen on the left, which is also O, means that you have neither enzyme, so you are not adding A or B sugars to your Hs. If you're A, you have the A enzyme, and you're adding GALNAC, which is that yellow, to your, to your H antigen. And if you're B, you have the B enzyme, and so you're adding GAL, which is the galacto, the, basically galactose, to the H antigen. If you're A, B, you have both. <clears throat> so this is just to remind people, the other thing that we care about in AB, the ABO blood group system is that it has not just what, what's important is on the red cell, but this is the, this is the system that's also important in what's in the plasma. The immune system reacts um, by six months of age to make an antibody to what you don't express. So if you are group A, your immune system will make anti-B, and that will be in your plasma. And likewise for B, if you're AB, you'll have both A and B on your cell, and so your immune system will not make either anti-A or anti-B and the opposite for group O. The reason that this is important is that for, for transfusion, you need to know that, that the person has made both, to be able to transfuse someone safely, you need to know both their front type, the red cell type, and the plasma type to make sure that you're not gonna give something incompatible. So when they don't agree, we call that an ABO incompatibility, or ABO discrepancy. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that. So, this is the ABH gene. It's located on chromosome nine, and it's about 18 kilobases. Exon six and seven code for most of what is expressed. Um, and again, now we'll talk about why, what makes those different blood groups, what makes their enzymes different. So for group O, it's just a one nucleotide deletion, 
makes a frame shift and it actually truncates the enzyme and the enzyme is no longer functional. And that's just a basic sort of group O person. I'm going to talk some more about the other specifics because it gets more complicated. Um, so for the question about the other blood groups, what makes an A an A? When we say A as a blood banker, we actually usually mean A1. And so an A1 versus a B is a difference of seven nucleotides. And what happens is that, and this is along the bottom, the colored, the colored codes for four amino acid substitutions. And so you'll see, just comparing A to B, that these are different amino acid substitutions. In position 268, that one's probably the most important of the, of the enzyme, and that's because it actually codes, and I'll show you a picture, more for the enzyme specificity. That, that position is in the enzyme binding pocket. So when the enzyme, the A or B enzyme, which are very, very similar to each other, their pocket's different. And so what they can add to that H antigen differs based on what their, po what their enzymatic pocket can do. So position 260 is glycine to alanine. So that's A1 versus B. For A2, which is a fairly common um, genetic alteration of A, is that a frame shift, or a, a single deletion basically disrupts the stop codon, and so more amino acids are added. And the A2 enzyme doesn't add, is not as good at adding A sugars. So a person who's A2 will actually have significantly less A on their red cell than a person who's A1, but they'll both be A, okay? Um, B, we already talked about. O1, this is an O, and this is what I, what I talked about in the previous slide. There's a deletion, it makes a stop codon, and it makes to a totally not functional um, enzyme. And then O2 is sort of similar to an A, but the difference is that in that pocket again, at 268, it doesn't, it ma that, ma that renders the pocket not charged, and so it can't add the sugar that it's supposed to add, and so therefore it can't add A or B. So this is just five ABO types. There's many more than this, actually. This is just kind of the basic ones. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about a case, and hopefully this will illustrate it a little bit better. Um, so this is a case that came to us at the blood center. So um, this is just a general way serologically that you would, you would look at someone's front type and back type to make sure that they, they agree in what they are. So you can, you can pick cells to transfuse. So the front type, the top, the anti-A and anti-B, those are reagents that we're adding to the patient's red cells. And they're reacting, that's that agglutination at four. So there's the, the anti-A and anti-B are telling you that there's A and B on the red cell. The serum, the back type, so you take the patient's serum and add reagent red cells, and now you're looking to see if in the sera there's anti-A or anti-B. And here in the B cells, you see that it reacts at one to two. So that means that there's anti-B in the sera. So this is what we would call an ABO discrepancy. And what, so basically, it's right. so it's a 64-year-old female with discrepant ABO typing. If this was a truly a group AB, we would expect to see the 4 plus in an, for the, just the way this one looks, but then the A1 and the B cell should not react because they shouldn't have anti-A or anti-B in their serum. <clears throat> so we um, looked at this case more closely. Um, because of where the science is right now with ABO, um, ABO typing genetically is actually done by sequencing. Um, there's not a chip. It's not on our chip, and it's not on many other chips that are available. And that's because of the heter one of the reasons is, as I said, the science is evolving, and the heterogeneity of this, of this locus is so vast that putting it on one chip is actually really very difficult, and we're just not there yet. So here's a very distilled <laughs> sequence analysis. Um, on the left, this is just showing um, a, a, a change from C to T which codes for proline to leucine. It doesn't confer an ABO type, but it does kind of tell you when you're looking through the, the, the bank of different choices for what the ABO type would be genetically. It gives insight to what allele it is. The one that really matters is an exon 7. The 803 G to C changes, if you remember I talked about 268 in the binding pocket, it changes that binding pocket back to be B-like, okay? And this is on one, this is just on one of the two DNA strands. So the result across the bottom, which looks very complicated, but it would just tell you that we have lots of choices for what the ABO alleles could be, is that one allele is ABO O2, so they're an O2, and then the other allele is an ABO cis AB. And so what that means is they're O2, the picture I showed you on one, and the other one, they're this other weird thing called cis AB. And what cis AB means is, this is the enzyme, that cleft is 
can both stick on a gal or a gal knack. So it's basically making the adding A or B sugars, not just A or just B. And but it doesn't add them really well. It sort of adds them middling amount, if you will. And um, so that's why the patient can make an anti-B as well. And there must be something different about how it adds the B, although we don't exactly know how. So it can make an anti, the patient makes an anti-B. So that one's really confusing. <laughs> confusing. But, um, but this is what this was. It was called, it's, an, it's a cis-AB, and it's been described. And it's just one of the things that when we see an ABO discrepancy, you have to consider. And then you have to think about what kind of blood are you going to transfuse this patient. So you would pick, because they have an anti-B, you wouldn't choose B, right? Because you don't want to give them a hemolytic transfusion reaction. So that isn't complica complicated enough. I'm going to talk about the hardest blood group system, or try to, which is the RH blood group system. Um, so RH has 43 antigens. It doesn't just have D, C, and E. A lot of people will say RH, we say if you're RH pos or neg, when we're talking about your blood type, that means are you D pos or neg, right? But there's also RH, D, and there's RH, C, E. There's two genes. And there's about 43 or different antigens within that blood group system. I'm going to just talk about D and C, E. This is just an introduction slide to show you that there's different ways that we name them. These two genes, as I'll show you in the next picture, are closely linked. And so they're inherited as haplotypes. So these are more typical of a blood group antigen. They're big transmembrane proteins, glycoproteins. Um, D and CE are located on chromosome 1, um, 69 kilobase pairs of DNA, 10 exons each. And um, D and CE, these two pictures, differ from a, by about 32 to 35 amino acids. And then CE, which can either be big C, little c, big E or little e, those differ by one position from exon, exon 2 and from one position in, for E as well. Um, and I'll show you how that happened in a minute. So this is, um, I think I'm going to skip to oops, this slide. D and, C, D and C, E are, are, are basically oriented like this towards each other, opposite orientation. And they're, very, they're right close together with just one little other gene in the middle. And so this is where this picture comes from. Um, ancestrally, people believe that d the big D, little c, little e haplotype is sort of where it all came from. And then these different point mutations and gene conversions between the two genes have created all these other haplotypes. And these matter because ant D is it, it's highly immunogenic. And so if you get a D positive blood transfusion and you're D negative, it's very, very likely that you will make an anti-D. And besides, the, besides D, C and E are also pretty immunogenic as well. So they're very important clinically, which is one of the reasons it's studied so much. <clears throat> so what makes you D positive or D negative? Well, it depends on your ethnic background. Um, if you're D positive in general, you, you, you'll have the D gene. And the blue and the red I put in there are hybrid boxes. So you have these little boxes at either side. And we use those for our testing. Then there's this SMP gene in the middle which I don't know the function in humans, but when you look it up, it says it's for a flagella, flagella in um, leishmaniasis. Um, <laughs> that's, and then you have the CE gene directly facing each other. If you're RHD negative, it becomes more complicated. Um, if you're Caucasian, most likely you have this entire D, which is what this picture would look like, is deleted. But you still will have your CE. And that haplotype is usually a little c, little e. If, you're at, if you have African descent, you might have some, your D gene inactivated by a mutation, or you might have a pseudogene, which is a duplication causing a premature stop codon. So depending on where you look in the genome for D, you could look positive, even though you have, the, you have to also look for the pseudogene to see if you're really negative. And the, if you're Asian descent, there's other alterations that you could be to be D negative. Um, and it's very actually very rare, people of Asian descent, to be D negative. <clears throat> So um, this picture is um, Dr. Wagner and Flagel um, came up with about how, why is there so much recombination between these two genes? And it's because they think it's because they're oriented like this, so they can very easily align in, a, in this little hairpin and exchange genetic material back and forth. And if you see picture C down below, um, there's a big piece of CE stuck in the D gene, okay? And that will change how you look 
on your red cell surface because they're going to code for different proteins. So there's some very common genetic alterations that we see all the time in the transfusion um, laboratory serologically that we need to be on the lookout for. And these are kind of categories of genetic alterations in D. So one of them is, is, mo is the residents will be very aware of because we talk about this all the time is a weak D. So weak D, it, if you look at the picture, it really I think shows it very well. The genetic alteration codes for a protein change that ends up being inside the membrane or inside the cell. So the epitope, the loops on the outside that the immune system can see are the same, but the changes co make the trafficking of the protein to the surface not as efficient. And so it's a, it ends up being a quantitative difference. So a person who's weak D positive will have fewer numbers of D on their cell than a person who's not weak D positive. The reason that that's important is that if we're typing someone for D, a patient, they might have so few Ds on their cell using antisera that we can't see it, and we might label them as D negative. If we do that, we can give them D positive cells, and we, it might, it, it can, it, actually, that's usually okay, but if they're a donor and we type them as D negative, there's enough there to sensitize someone else. So we have to test for that for donors. Um, the partial D is, is a little bit more problematic because the, if you compare it to the other picture, the partial D picture shows that your genetic alterations happen in the loops of that protein on the outside of the cell. So actually the immune system can see it as a non-wild type D. And so these, if, if, the, if, the, if we've typed them and our antisera types this as positive because it just happens to look at an epitope that hasn't been changed, <coughs> we'll type them as D positive. Then when we give them regular D positive cells, they can make an anti-D. So a partial D person will present as D positive but made an anti-D. Something about their D gene has been changed. So especially for pregnant women, we need to be aware of this. We want to make sure that they should get D negative cells because we don't want them to make an anti-D. So um, that was kind of the, the basic um, genetic, common genetic alterations with um, D. This is um, taking it a little bit more complicated to look at when you actually have the crossing over of the two genes because they're so close to each other, um, things that could happen um, in, in different, in, in black and Caucasian populations. And it, the picture is really nice because it shows where, they, where the exon came from. Full exons come from one gene into the other gene. Um, the top upper right, the CES one, I'll talk a little bit more about. But this is just to show that there's more than this. There's many types of, of, of D and CE alterations, but this is just a, a picture to show that you can imagine these code for different proteins on the, on the cells. So um, the, I call this advanced because I had a really hard time when I first learned about this, understanding this. <laughs> but, so this is that one that I just showed on, this top, on the top upper right, CES. And I'm going to bring it up because of the first bullet point. 22% of African Americans actually have this alteration. Um, and so what happens is that it's, this haplotype is usually D negative. The C is altered. And so what that means is that when I use antisera in the serology lab, it will type as C positive. If I give that person big C positive blood, about 30% of them will make an anti-C, okay? The RHE, the, the little E in this haplotype is also weak, and so patients can sometimes make an anti little e or this other thing called an anti HRB. So, um, and we can detect this using genomics. So, even though I'll wait for questions later, does anybody know why we would care so much about this one mutation? So, it's because of um, sickle cell anemia, because those that's a group of African Americans who need a lot of blood transfusions, and the blood transfusion comes from primarily a Caucasian. Do, do, um, the Caucasian donor base. And so we, we have problems with D, C, and E antibodies in sickle cell patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that so I can bring you through sort of coming back to the indications for molecular blood group typing. So um, sickle cell disease, as everybody knows, is a hemoglobinopathy. Um, it's a homozygous mutation for hemoglobin uh, beta chain. And clinically, patients have red cell hemolysis and veno occlusion. Um, a very, this is the, the, out of all groups of patients, this is the group that makes the most red cell antibodies. Um, 30 to 50 percent, 
can make, a red cell an make red cell antibodies, and most are directed at the RH or the Kel systems. Um, they do make other antibodies as well. So molecular blood group typing can benefit, and I'll show you why, um, but pr predominantly with RH, Duffy, and MNS. So the standard of care for sickle cell patients is that we, we've known this before we had molecular typing, we knew that this was a problem. And so basically what you do is you provide RH, C, E, and Kel match cells. So this is the one of the only patient groups who really gets this. Most people that are getting a transfusion, you're provided cells that match you for R, ABO and D, not for these other blood groups. So, and that's because the allo immunization rate is about 3% per exposure if they're not typed like this, and it goes down to about 0.5% per, per exposure if they're typed this way. Um, this CAP survey I thought was interesting. Over 1,000 um, health care facilities were surveyed, and even though I, this is really the standard of care, when they were asked what they would provide a sickle cell patient, you could see that um, th they're not it's not necessarily implemented countrywide, and that's because my, my thinking is that this was getting all sorts of sizes of healthcare facilities, and probably some healthcare facilities don't have any experience with transfusing a sickle cell patient. But usually in larger cities and academic medical centers, there'll actually be a program specifically for sickle cell patients and how they're going to be transfused. <clears throat> so this, this graph is a little bit crooked, but let me just tell you what I want you to get out of it. So. Um, this is in sickle cell patients, and this is a study that looked at averting antibody formation. So, so if we if if we matched for this for RH and Kel or more, can we potentially not have as much red cell allo immunization? And what the study looked at is if you look at the upper left red box, is that if you use this limited but but more extensive than than the general population red cell typing, they took 137 patients who had made red cell antibodies, and then they said they looked back and said. If we had matched all along from the first day they got transfusions at this level, how many antibodies would we have prevented? And the problem with someone who has a lot of antibodies is that once they have the antibody, we have to make sure that we provide them cells that are negative for that antigen. So it can be very hard to find them blood. And that's the problem with patients that have, with sickle cell patients, is that they can have lots of antibodies and yet they need transfusion regularly and we have to help, we have to find them safe blood so we don't cause a hemolytic transfusion reaction. So in this instance with about 140 people that had made antibodies, 53%, that's the number to take from there, 53% of people, if they had always gotten that level of match, would have, not, would have made no antibodies, okay? Um, and in white donors, that's about 13.6% of the white donor population would fit that bill, would be able to be the donor for them. If you went to this higher level of match, so adding in um, S, Duffy, and Kid, um, you would avert 70% of all antibodies in this population. But you'd see in the white donors, only 0.6 of white donors would actually be compatible with, with that matching algorithm. So it incredibly decreases. So the question we're left with is, you know, should we match for more than RH and Kel? Um, this paper predicts, you know, what I was saying, 53, a, a, a reduction for, if we went to this higher level of match of 70% of patients would be free of antibody formation. One thing to remember, that original slide I said about sickle cell patients is that 30 to 50% of them make antibodies, but that means that, you know, up to 50% of them don't. So it's, an, it's expensive and it's, a, it's hard to find cells and can we even do that? So is it even feasible? Is it the best use of our resources to do this? If about half or more than half are actually never going to make an antibody, should we match for all these, these antigens? And um, if we do, should we do it for all sickle cell patients only after their first antibody or how high of a match? I'm not going to be able to answer these questions, but see, these, are, these are the questions that we kind of think about with this. And what I'm going to, I'm going to come, I'm going to talk about Duffy for a few minutes and to, so I can introduce one more blood group. And then I'm going to come back to this, these questions and try to answer them a little bit about how we've thought about it at the blood center. <clears throat> oh, and I have uh, one more study I forgot to tell you about. So um, this is sort of a clinical study because the other study was just a modeling study to say how many can we prevent, how many antibodies can we prevent. This is a clinical study um, doing a, pros a prospective trial using bioarray phenotype match red cells to sickle cell patients. So what that means is they took 144 sickle cell patients, ran them through the same chip that we use, and then they took about 1,000 donors, ran them through the same chip. Okay, so now they have donors and they have patients typed, and then they tried to provide higher matched cells. Um, 
15 of the 42 patients ha had aloe antibodies, and um, they had all and had been recently transfused. These are ones too that they found a discrepancy between their genotype and their serologic phenotype, and that's because the mixed field. So if you have multiple red cell populations, it's really hard to be able to type your, your red cells because you're looking at the red cell itself. <clears throat> so the attempted match that they did um, is listed here. Those are the blood group systems. And 93% had units available, which was actually pretty high. Um, and the thing that was interesting, which is why I bring up this paper, is that the, of the alloimmunized patients, those ones with antibodies, they showed better in vivo survival. So when they gave the cells that were matched based on their genotype, because it wasn't messed up by their mixed field, um, that they had better hemoglobin bumps and their frequency that they needed transfusion was stretched. So that's sort of a hint of a clinical thing. It, there's not a lot in the literature about if clinically it matters. So this is pretty much the only one I could find. So, okay, so now I'm just gonna do a couple words about the Duffy blood group system and then come back to sickle cell patients and you'll see why. So the Duffy blood group system is um, two exons located on chromosome one, um, 1.52 kilobase pairs of DNA. Here's a picture of it. Um, Duffy A and Duffy B just differ by um, the position that at 125 N to an A. And um, it's, a, it's actually a chemokine receptor, and I've listed sort of what, what it's a receptor for. The thing that's interesting in terms of transfusion is along the bottom. These are the rates in Caucasian African and, and Chinese populations. And you'll see that the Duffy AB phenotype is incredibly, incredibly rare in Caucasians. But in Africans, it's 68%. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The reason for that is that Duffy is the receptor for Plasmodium vivax. And so the upstream promoter for Duffy is a GATA box. And in um, people of African descent, there has been a mutation in that GATA box promoter, which makes Duffy B not express only in red cell lineage. So what happens is that you can give someone Duffy B positive, if, if, you, if you have this mutation, you can give them Duffy B positive cells. They s shouldn't make a Duffy B antibody because the rest of their cells actually have Duffy B on them. It's just their red cells don't. And they mutated that because of malaria. So um, this finding the Duffy B mutation is not able to be done using serology. It can only be done using genomics because if you type them serologically, they're going to be Duffy A neg B neg. If you type them genetically, you'll say, oh, well, who cares if they're Duffy A or B? We want to see in the GATA place, are they positive or negative for that mutation? <clears throat> and so basically, I think about this as a way to expand the inventory again. Because when you look at trying to match cells for people of African <coughs> descent, it's hard if you have a Caucasian data base to, I mean, a donor base to find cells. So here's getting back to our little, uh, we did an inventory study, and this was just to basically get at that first bullet question that I said, is it even feasible to match for hire? I'm not, we're not actually convinced if clinically it's definitely better, but is it feasible? Um, and so Dr. Katie Wilkinson, who's one of our fellows, helped me with this this year. So we took 67 sickle cell patients that we have genotyped, and this is, pretty, this is basically their, the breakdown of their red cell um, genotypes. Um, 19, 19 of them, or 28%, had antibodies, so it's right on target for what I've said before, 30 to 50% make antibody. Um, 12, or 17%, had that altered um, RHCE haplotype that I talked about that's very common in African Americans. Again, so it's sort of right on target for what the literature says. The GATA positive is very, very high. You see 85% of them have a Duffy, that Duffy silencing mutation. And then the rest of these are just negative antigens. So another thing about finding blood for someone if you're trying to match them, the more negative antigens you have, the harder it is because it's more and more rare but it tends to be more in the African American population. So you'll see that six negative antigens, 40% of these people had six negative antigens, um, and 22% had seven negative antigens. So this tells you right here, this is probably a pretty hard group to find blood for. So what we did is we took their red cell phenotype based on their genotype and plugged it into our computer system and then saw what it spit out for how many units were available on that day, just to see. <clears throat> and this is what we got. So um, the first set right here is basically there's two, there's two um, groups. 
there's the first set is to do RH and Kel match. That's the standard match that we do. And we do do that RH and Kel match like I talked about before. If you have that haplotype that, that VSV or the other name for it is R prime little s, we wanted to make sure you got big C negative blood because of the danger of making an anti-big C. The way to do that in a Caucasian database is to use D negative blood. So that's <laughs> In a, in a very basic way. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can type it more specifically. But um, So this is showing, we have a lot of units right, for this, and we do pretty well finding units for, th for, th for these patients. If you do fully matched, which is ABO, RH, Kel, Kid, Duffy, and S, it goes, way, it goes quite a bit down. And you'll see for D negative, it's even quite low to be able to have enough units, you know, somewhere between 7 to 40 units. By then knowing the Duffy, because now I could say, well, say, I know that you're Duffy, you're typing Duffy neg, but I know you have the GATA box mutation, so I can give you Duffy B positive cells. It expands the inventory. You see it go back up again. So this is just showing um, with probably too many colors and a little bit too much complexity that, that the genotyping can give you some information that is beneficial to helping potentially um, find blood for these patients. So um, now I'm just going to talk quickly about some other uses for genomic blood group typing. Um, this is what we do also a lot in the lab is obstetrics cases. So I think the best way to illustrate is to just use a little case. So there'll be a, so this is a woman who's had a, a 34-year-old G0P1, so she's pregnant, first time, and her prenatal type and screen reveals an anti-D. Um, the mom is serologically D-negative, and the father of the baby is serologically D-positive. The history of the anti-D is unclear. She's never been pregnant before, but she says she was in a car accident in Mexico and was, was transfused. So maybe that's where she got it. Um, and so the question is, will the, will the pregnancy be affected? Um, there's no way to tell by the serology if dad has a, a, a is heterozygous for D, so big D or, and D negative, or if he's homozygous for D, big D, big D, which would give the baby 100% chance of being D positive. So the two methods possible using genomics is to test the father of the baby using zygosity testing or to actually get amniocytes and type the baby cells. So this is just, I just want to show you about D-zygosity testing. This is another schematic of the gene in the upper right um, and the primers that we use. So what we actually look for is on either side of the D gene are, bo are hybrid, are boxes, and um, of basically repeats. And, and when the gene is deleted, it comes together and makes this thing called a hybrid box. So it actually, using the same primers in, different, in those different situations, will actually give you a different, different PCR product. And then by using RFLP, you use um, restriction enzymes to cut the product, and you get different splice patterns based on if there's one copy of D and one copy of not D, or two copies of D, or no copies of D. And that's what the pattern looks like. So if the father of the baby is DD, there's a 100% chance that D, baby is D positive. If the father of the baby is big D, little d, which means absence of D, then, there's a, then you can either say there's a 50% chance, or you can say if you really want to know, you can request amniocytes. So um, I didn't put the answer here for this one because it doesn't really matter. It's just to show you how, how that works. Um, so the last sort of use that we use um, frequently at the blood center is actually on blood donors. <clears throat> so because we have this chip that's relatively high throughput and able to do a whole red cell genome, except for ABO and D, we can use that to try to genotype our donors. And there's a reason that we want to genotype certain types of ethnicities, and that's, I think I've shown that to you, based on different ethnic backgrounds, people have different expression of, of their blood group genes. And so when someone comes to donate at the blood center, we ask them these questions. Um, if, if, they, if they will identify their ethnic heritage. And if they will, and they tell us that they're Asi either Asian, Pacific Islander, African American, or Native American descent, we will then, and they give us permission, we will then genotype their red cells. And that information can then be used to compile a larger donor database and hopefully uncover some more rare um, and clinically useful blood donors. So um, we've gotten about 8,500 donors done out of the 10,000 goals, so it's pretty good. Um, this is just to show you some of the rare um, donors that we found. So again, we're, when you're looking for blood donors that are precious, it's people that don't express antigens, basically, that are negative for antigens, because you'd be giving those to somebody who has an antibody. 
<coughs> so this is just a list of a bunch of kid A, B negative. And then there's just some comments that aren't really important, but you know, those are shipped, we ship them. So what happens if you need rare cells in this country is that we have, there's a rare donor registry. And so when someone needs them someplace else, like South Carolina, they'll call and then we'll respond and say we have them and ship them to them. So those are, those, this is um, donors that are negative for high incidence antigens or, or things that are uncommon. And then this is also, when I talked about the sickle cell patients, they have this high rate of being negative for lots of the common antigens. So you're also a ra relatively rare blood donor if you fit that bill, that you have the relatively common blood groups, you have a lot of negative antigens. So this is also that we found. So it's pretty, I think there's about 800 pretty rare people that we've found so far. So it's, it's promising and, and it will increase our database of people that we want to preserve and kind of grow their donation career. <clears throat> So this is, I think, my second to last slide. Um, so, for, so overall, um, the indications for genomic red cell typing is um, discrepant serologic results. So we talked about that with ABO discrepancies. Also, sometimes trying to figure out, like with a partial D, if the red cell antibody is allo or auto, you know, trying to find out um, what is that patient really under, you know, um, genetically. If we can't get a sample for the red cell phenotypes, that's the case of a fetus. Um, when zygosity matters, that's the paternal sample. Um, when no anti-sera exists, so that's the Dombrock blood group system. Post-transfusion samples are the mixed cell population, so someone who's had a lot of red cell transfusions, we can't figure out their phenotype. Um, interfering antibodies, this is when you have like a, a warm autoimmune, either hemolytic anemia or just a warm autoantibody um, that will not allow the anti-sera to get at the red cell. And um, a lot of what I talked about with the sickle cell patients is serologic, serological things that we care about that we can't really detect serologically. So the co complex RH phenotypes that are seen in sickle cell patients and other patient groups, the Duffy silencing mutations that I didn't really talk about, but there's MNS um, silencing mutations as well that we can pick up using our chip. And then lastly, the desire to type large numbers of people. So that's the blood donors. So um, I think that, oh, here's my conclusion slide. Um, so, you know, in general, I hope that I've shown to everybody here that red cell um, genotyping is useful and becoming necessary. Um, with serology, we really can solve the preponderance of, of, of medical problems that we have in, in, in the transfusion service, but the molecular testing does augment our, ability, our serologic typing and in some cases provides clear advantages, especially with obstetrics patients and some of the sickle cell patient issues. Um, I've reviewed three blood groups, ABO, um, which has discrepant front and back typing, RH, which is very complex, it has many indications, especially obstetrics and sickle, and Duffy, which um, the genetic information can basically enlarge the inventory that we could provide for patients. And I've reviewed indications. And I just wanna leave you with um, that this is a, a definitely an evolving new field and that our scientific understanding is growing. A lot of times we are calling around the country, talking to other people who do the same thing and saying, have you ever seen this? Because it's new and different and we're not exactly sure what to do with it. So that's everything. I'm just gonna thank all the people who, who, do, who actually do all this work. Um, Gail Taramura is um, on the left with, with her group. So um, Shelly, Tara, Prashant, and Samantha do a lot of our clinical um, testing. Those are the samples that we're able to sort of sign out, we have validated tests for. And Dr. Lakshmi Gower and her group, which is Madhavi, Maria, Jeff, and Jocelyn, are our research group. And so they're actually developing assays and doing sequencing and things that sort of the cutting edge of what's coming next in blood group typing. And also definitely figuring out when we have discrepancies with our typing that we don't understand, they help us figure it out. And then Dr. Katie Wilkinson, who's um, been helping with the sickle cell inventory project. So thanks so much for your time. Theoretically possible, but I don't know if it's actually ever happened. Is there a problem with donor white cells confounding potential results for genotyping? Can you repeat the question. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm supposed to I'm supposed to repeat repeat the question. So donor white cells um, confounding the genotyping results of a patient. So you mean if they've been transfused a lot? Um, it, it can, so it's more of an issue that if it's a leukocyte reduced unit, and I'm trying to type a donor unit, that there's not enough white cells. But I don't, there, there would have to be, 
tons of white cells there to make that a problem. And if you suspected that, you could use a, a buccal swab or something, but I've never seen, we've never seen that as a problem. It's more the other way that there's not enough, or the patient's like a, an acute leukemic that just dropped their count, and so we can't get enough white cells to type them. What's the turnaround time for these kind of uh, extended genotype, and are things like Luminex going to speed that up if you were to switch platform? So Sean's question was, what's the turnaround time, and will Luminex speed it up? Um, <clears throat> so the turnaround time for the, the chip is about a day, if we get it, a day and a half. Um, the turnaround time for an RH workup, you know, is it an allo antibody, is it an auto, is this a partial D, is this a weak D, can be over a week because it's it, because we, we do some testing, and then we say, oh, we've got to do this other gel, or we've got to do this other thing, and then we've got to send it for sequencing, so it can take a really long time. Um, there are Luminex platforms that are going to kind of mimic what the chip can do right now, and the, the one I've seen, they actually want to do a separate Luminex platform for um, D, but at the same time, when you ask the real experts in the field, they'll say that the science isn't quite there yet to be able to say, because you know, like the problem with the pseudogene in, in the, the um, RFLP that we do for zygosity, if you are of African American descent and we're trying to figure out zygosity, the, that little RFLP that I showed you often doesn't work because their mutation is different. So um, I feel like we're not there with D, but the, but the Luminex is, is coming and I, it might make it faster, but the, but the chip's pretty fast right now and a lot of people are jumping on board to make new chips to have ABO on there as well. So I would like to answer that question really. Luminex and then chip will take the same amount of time. The yeah. only thing, Luminex is, if any, Luminex is a little bit longer because uh, if you do HLI typing with Luminex, it will take, after PCR, it will take about two hours. And then it will take the same amount of time. Yeah. What's, what's the cost of the array and, and, and the Luminex asset? So the question is, what's the cost? Um, the array, I don't know, because we don't have it. Um, the chip is about $500 a, a chip. Um, and the, sim like the multiplexes that I didn't really show that are more simple or, are less expensive than that. It sort of just, just matters what your question is. But, you sh but you know, the hardest ones are, and the most expensive ones that can mount are sort of RH sometimes because we have to keep going because we can't be sure until we look in multiple, you have to, it just, it, I think it, I would say, the more places you have to look in the gene, the more expensive it's gonna be because you have to do multiple assays. <clears throat> Is that an area where you think God, high throughput sequencing has, uh, might have a role? Potentially for, for D, um, and I think the, our lab and some of the other labs in the country, that's, with D, that's where we are. You know, we do some places where we look at different exons that we think we know, it, we, that we know the SNP there, but if it's not working out, we send it for sequencing, you know, and we just have to decide which exons to sequence or introns sometimes too. Yeah. Great talk. It Thanks. seems like blood banking is special, among other reasons, because it is so highly regulated compared yeah. to other areas. Do you run into issues where you want to deploy a new method, but you're, you can't because of regulatory reasons? And you can examples of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, blood banking is very regulated, um, and, and not even just that it's laboratory medicine, it would, it, because this is the testing of, it's different when you're going to make the transfusion decision, but, um, and if that, if we've run across that. So we run across it all the time. Um, when we have ABO discrepancies in the transfusion service, we send them to Dr. Gower to, to do um, ABO sequencing, but we can't generate a report. Um, because it's not a val it can't be really validated at the level that it's right now, but we can find it and we know what it is. So we have we kind of walk <laughs> this line of, of well, we we know what their antibodies are. So to make the transfusion decision, you don't transfuse if there's an antibody there, um, and then you try to sort it out. You know, there's the other issue that comes up with ABO is that sometimes they're blood donors, and to be able to legally label a unit, you have to be able to get a clean ABO type. So in those cases, you can't get a clean ABO type. So we, we basically say to the donor that we can't get a clean ABO type, and so we can't actually use you as a donor because you have to be, because of the regs, you have to be able to serologically Your type them. is scheduled to end in two minutes. Whoa. <laughs> 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 well, with that, I'll ask you, are there any more questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs>